Hi everybody, welcome to my channel, Life Law Bin. Now, Matthew, this is what we really, really came to talk about today, and it's the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives, um, you know, what we call SELEX. So let's start from the very, very basics for the person who does not know, has never heard about SELEX. Let's start there. What is it? So the, it stands for, let's get the whole name in there, the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. And they are for the purposes of the Legal Services Act 2007, an authorized legal regulator. Now they regulate both authorized persons and also um, they have other forms of mem mem uh, membership as well. They've got graduate, uh, associate uh, and other schemes there. Fellows become authorized persons. And I think this is coming on to the next question. So I won't go into too much detail there yet, but um, fellows become authorized persons, but they become authorized persons with a very limited or basic capacity first, because Silex's model doesn't operate in opposition to the bar model. It doesn't operate in opposition to the roles. Um, they operate symbiotically, but differently with different models. The, the, the way, if I can put it, they're all united in one aim, and that is to protect the consumer. Uh, when it comes to the provision of legal services by setting minimum standards or minimum quality assurance standards. Now, in terms of an advocate's own brand, it would certainly be in their interest not simply to settle for the minimum, go above and beyond, but they will say you have to be hitting these standards, and if you're not, then you've got an ethical problem. Silex does that by a different model to the bar and the rules, but a model which isn't in opposition to those two models. The, the, the bar model, it has, the, it has been the lo longest standing model that's been able to achieve, uh, on the whole, uh, a very so sophisticated or very su a superior form of advocacy. And I, I have had the opportunity to compare the advocacy that I've seen from uh, different jurisdictions, and I do have to say on the whole, uh, there, there are exceptions uh, in various places, um, but on the whole, what I see coming from the Bar of England and Wales does tend to emanate um, quite superiorly, superiorly, but, um, and they've been very good at maintaining that, but the problem with that model is that it's very academically intensive and very costly, whereas now the bar is making great strides. Absolutely, the, they're working onerously and very hard at being able to open up and, and accommodate more kind of um, diverse perspectives and different socioeconomic backgrounds. But it doesn't change that the traditional model that we're working with has a lot of onerous academic requirements. And with that, um, there's gonna be costs associated with each stage. And even the pupillage model itself still has some difficulties in the fact that that first six is a non-practicing six. So that means you're limited to a grant and you can't take in any other income until you get a provisional license to be able to practice. Whereas Silex to some degree can uh, alleviate that and supplement that, not replace it, but alleviate and supplement by virtue of their kind of work along learning program. And it's these kind of approaches that pull together to create a more um, diverse and socioeconomically open um, legal profession. Uh, and it's about working with each of the regulators and each of the regulators having a different role to play rather than competing with each other regulator for superiority. I think too, it, it, it also seems to very much fit the person as well. Um, yes. because as you, you rightfully pointed out, the bar, it, it's, it's no surprise, the bar is a very, very expensive uh, route to pursue. And uh, some of us simply don't have the finances uh, to, to, to make it, to make it on that route. So it's actually 
one can actually see this as more of a breath of fresh air because at least you're not limited to one option. No, yeah, so, so Matthew, why did you choose uh, to seek admission to the charter rather than pursuing the bar? Well, that would have been to secure independent practice rights and uh, rights of audience uh, without a training contract and a pupillage. And could you, could you explain to us the process of seeking admission to the, to the charter? The process is, again, this is why it's not intended to shy people away from how it work. It's just offering a different model. It is an intensive uh, and, um, okay, I can put it even to tedious, but it is a very resource intensive process. Um, it's just a different process. Uh, the good news is that you're able to earn whilst you're engaging with it. Um, and it works with your professional profile to be able to exhibit uh, two examples of each of their competencies. And so that would be the first, well, the first step, let's, I think I've gone ahead of myself here. So let, let's go back to the first step. You need to be a member of Silex. And with that, they have different forms of members. Now I was able to come in at the graduate member status. As a graduate member, you then have to be a member for a year before you then become eligible to apply for fellowship. Now, I think they've somewhat changed the process because I just went in just ahead of this whole CPQ thing. So I think there's some variations in the process to what I did. Uh, now everything's under the CPQ, which was coming in at the time that I was applying and going through the process. Um, so some of the stuff might be from the, uh, the older process. But my first step was to become a graduate member. And then I had to be a mem that graduate member for a year before I could move to fellowship. Graduate members are not authorized persons under the Legal Services Act 2010, uh, 2010, 2007, and do not have any uh, ability to exercise any independent um, rights of audience or even practice rights to that degree. When it, it, after that year, you're able to then make an application to become a fellow. And that involves quite a sophisticated and lengthy uh, portfolio where you need to put in two examples signed by your supervisor, who has to be an authorized person, um, of your work that then relates to their competency requirements. And those are available on their website of the work-based work learning. And once you have those two examples signed off by your supervisor, you can have that assessed as part of your portfolio. If they find that those have met their competency requirements, they can then pass you, uh, take you through some further checks after that. I think there's reference checks and then also a DBS, but then provided all the formalities are in order, um, then you can meet uh, admission as a fellow. Once you have the admission as a fellow, you only get, see the way that the SRA and the bar work is that when you qualify off the, after the training contract or the pupillage, you get everything. You become a, a qualify as a general practitioner. Now, that's not to say you are, because there are specialist pupillages out there, and there are specialist training contracts out there. So whilst you are getting all the rights part and parcel on successful completion of the training contract or the pupillage, there's kind of like an honor system there. And that honor system is saying, well, if you've done a civil pupillage, then you're not gonna go off and conduct a murder trial at the Old Bailey. But nonetheless, your license will say four rights uh, to conduct litigation with the SRA or four rights of audience uh, with the bystanders board. But that doesn't mean you're gonna use them. With Silex, they don't do that. Silex mandates you have to specialize. You can specialize in more than one thing, but you have to show a specialty. And when you've established that, that specialty, they will authorize you only in that specialty. And so then you can only get rights that are associated with that specialty. The fellow rights automatically come with commissioner of the oaths um, and certain other activities, but no rights of audience other than what is mentioned in that Lord Chancellor's directions. And I've got the, the reference on that one. It was the county courts, um, Act. I think I was coming to a different question on this one. Um, but as we go further down, it is the, um, 
county court order or something to that degree, um, which gives you rights to work independently with non-contested adjournment requests and judgments by consent. But outside of that, you would have to do so through a supervisor and, and would do so as an exempt person. You would not be an authorized person. Um, and then after that, you can apply for practice rights. But I think I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no, no. And it, But what becomes very clear is that this is a very rigorous approach. And yes. there are many structures in place to protect, as you would have mentioned before, the consumer or the client. So this is not an option where you can, you know, easy categorize it as the easy way to go. No. It definitely is not. <laughs> it, it's not the easy way at all. <laughs> it, it definitely is not. And that that's that is abundantly clear. So so what what I want you to explain now for us is how did you move now from being a fellow to applying to be a litigator and advocate? I'm grateful. Um, on that was where, again, a lengthy process. And in fact, I was admitted as a fellow uh, January 2021. I then went immediately and made, well, pretty much immediately. I think it wasn't like the next day. I think a few days or maybe a week or so after, put in an application to be cut for extending my rights. So with a fellow, I had that restrictive package um, or that basic package. And then I want to now extend that so that I can have rights of audience in all first instance courts and tribunals uh, in civil law. Of course, when I say first instance, not senior. So it would not be applicable in the high court because the high court does sit as a first instance court. I do not have rights for that. But in terms of extending my rights to include all county court work and tribunal work, that is when I put in an application for that specific, I think Silex calls it open court advocacy. And that is another process which involves a smaller portfolio, but a portfolio where you need to provide examples of your experience uh, showing that you pit certain competencies, again, signed off by your supervisor. Two references are required from authorized persons. Um, and then that'll be assessed by an assessor. And the, the assessor can do three things, reject your application, uh, accept your application, or make a request for further information. And that's simply saying, well, actually, I'm, not, I don't think you've exhibited the outcome by this example, but if you can supply this, this, and this, uh, we can reconsider that because uh, you might actually have it. You just haven't um, provided enough information to make it out at this stage. So saying having to reject your application so that you send back another application and pay another fee, they've got that request for further information where they will work with you as opposed to um, you put it in, they make a decision. If you don't have it all there, you put it in again and pay another fee they actually do a more active approach, similar to um, House of Lords and House of Commons ping pong before a bill goes to royal assent. Um, so that, that request for further information bit is really helpful and really does uh, get people working together um, so that we can hopefully keep things more efficient than having to start processes all over again and pay more fees. Um, so once that process has been dealt with successfully, uh, then they can approve. They can either, they can either approve or reject you. Um, if you get the approval, um, then sorry, as competent, then the next step is to do another DBS, and then they need to vet your references. Once that's done, they can approve you, and if you're approved, then you get your rights. So whereas the roles and the bar got their rights right after training contractor pupillage, as a fellow, I didn't actually get mine until, so January admitted, until December of that year. And so it took almost another year for me to get the extended rights on top of the fellowship. With that though, it is different as I say, because the bar doesn't give out direct access uh, with the successful completion of a pupillage. And they don't give out the litigation extension on your license with the successful completion of a pupillage. Those are two things you can apply after for endorsements on your license, but they won't give them out as part and parcel, whereas 
once you've got the extended rights of silex, you can you can conduct litigation, um, save for it being in your specialty, um, and also uh, you've you've got the because you're a litigator and advocate, and then also you've got the ability to go direct access, provided it would be best practice to have insurances in place uh, to that degree, and uh, that you've covered yourself in terms of quality assurance there. But nonetheless, the license will allow you to do those things, whereas the bar does need to make a further application to conduct litigation and a further application to get direct access. Uh, whereas the solicitors have the conducting of litigation right after they complete um, the, the training contract. But what they don't have is the higher rights that the bar would have right after, um, right after the um, successful completion of pupillage. So there's all different things going in different places here between the different different regulators, just showing the different processes, but again, just showing that they're all hard work, but they're not necessarily working in opposition to each other. They're filling uh, gaps and working symbiotically alongside each other to try to get a more diverse and more um, open access to the legal perfection by breaking down barriers. And what the bar misses, then hopefully the SRA and Silex can get alongside numerous other approved regulators. I'm just mentioning the three here, uh, but there are several others. I think there's a Law Society of Cost Draftsmen uh, and various other things listed under the Legal Services Act 2007. Um, but they all work together to fill different gaps and, and work symbiotically. Um, but once that's done, then you've got your extended rights. Now that is not higher rights. You will still, at this point, that is where Silex stops in terms of my journey. And I think I'm coming on to another question, so I'll, I'll wait before we go into that. But the extended rights package is where we get to uh, in your specialty, where, which is in terms of rights of audience, without a further application successful to the Legal Services Board, is where Silex would be capped. Well, Matthew, even without me asking you um, in depth about permitted rights of audience and, and the stages of applying and the restrictions, I feel like you have answered uh, and explained that that whole rights of our audience uh, aspect of our interview very well. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with that because you've explained that um, after now you've, you, you have achieved your extended rights, there is in effect a cap, a cap there and then um and i think it then it then brings us neatly uh to a space where we where we can analyze the benefits yes. and this is where now i'm going to ask you what do you think are the benefits of being a silex lawyer uh there, there are many um the, the one is and if i can bring it back to that road analogy it gets you off that congested motorway because right now when you're looking at um, these rights of audience, they are, it is a reserved legal activity in accordance with the Legal Services Act 2007. So there's going to be a lot less people that are going to be able to exercise those rights. So one of the things uh, that uh, I've learned from the bar and I'm, I'm much indebted to is in order to get that pupillage, it is about securing or even to advance in other ways. It's not just about the pupillage, but that being one aspect, if you want to compete you need a USB, that unique selling point. And how do you get a unique selling point straight out of academia when everybody's either gonna have the marks or if you don't have the marks, then you've got to get that practical experience even more so. Um, so in terms of how do you get a USB to compete with people coming out of academia? Well, you need to get where they aren't. And how do you get to where they aren't? Well, you need to get things that are reserved for um, practitioners, so that when you come back, you can get back onto that motorway, but ahead of the congestion. And I'm minded by another analogy, um, but who won the race between the tortoise and the hare? The tortoise. It's true, it's true. Um, I think Definitely, that's what people need. Uh, we're, we're always looking for unique selling points because as you know, there's sometimes like 300 spots available and thousands of candidates applying. How do yes. you stand out from the pack? It's hard. 
it's difficult. And I'd even say it's even more challenging um, when you aren't necessarily a, a UK resident. Um, you know, you, you always feel maybe like you're on borrowed time and um, you, you have to find a way to, as you said, uh, create that unique selling point. Now, do you think that there are any cons? I mean, I've, I've listened to you and I think it's actually wonderful. I think that if, if persons have the opportunity, they should seize it. But do you think there are any cons of, of possessing this type of qualification? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say the only thing is because it's developing your practice. It's, again, it does depend on what you want to do. I mean, if you want to be a general practitioner, you can do it because you can then acquire a civil specialty. And then there's nothing to stop you now theoretically going off and getting a criminal specialty. Uh, and then going off and doing a family specialty, but you would have to do them three separate times and it just takes so long. So it would be the time in doing that. It doesn't really work to those that want to be uh, general practitioners or common law practitioners. It, it really is based on the specialty model and having specialist practitioners. Um, and it, it is interesting because I at one point thought, well, let me go common law and then I'll find out where my strengths lie and I'll go with that. But the pressure to specialize now is, is very early on. Um, and I don't want, it, it, I think in terms of, it, it's not that common law practitioners are jacks of all trade. They do each um, area of law that is right. And they don't have that necessarily, that only sole focus. But I have seen brilliant work emanating from the common law bar in particular. And, and I've, it's, not that they, it's not that they're jacks of all trade. Um, the, the, there is brilliant advocacy that, that, that comes out of there, but it is different. And there is a pressure to specialize earlier and earlier now. Um, and with that, Silex is set up to that specialist model. Um, but if you are looking to say, I don't know where I, I want to get my feet and I, maybe want to learn a little bit of this and then learn a little bit of that and then learn a little bit of that, the model is more set up for specializing. Yeah, and I, I, th I think you definitely can see that trend towards specializing, even on the gateway, the pupillage gateway. They, they, there are now many more opportunities for pupils to indicate a, a specific area. Um, and yes. I'd actually dare to say that there are a lot more a lot less, I should say, common law spaces. Um, yes. You see them uh, in the past a lot more, seem to have been a lot more frequent, but now chambers are really leaning, a lot of chambers are leaning towards a, a specialty. Now, I know that as an advocate, we're usually asked, um, you know, when, especially when you're, you're now starting, what's your role? Maybe are you a solicitor's agent? You know, ushers like to, to, to note that down. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, they, they like to ask, are you counsel, are you a solicitor, are you a solicitor's agent? What What is your status? So now that you are also a litigator, an advocate, do you find that you have any challenges with your status now? Was it ever confused uh, with, with counsel or, or solicitor? And how do you overcome the challenge if, if you're, ever, you're ever presented with it? Yes, and that is a very important point, because regardless of which advocate you are, if you're a solicitor advocate, if you're a solicitor, if you're from the bar, if you're from Silex, they all unite in one under golden thread of an overriding duty. And that, whilst you have fiduciary relations to your client, your overriding duty is not to your client, your overriding duty is to the court. So fundamentally, the most important thing is not misleading that court knowingly or recklessly. And on that front, um, the way that I've gone about that is to ensure that when you sign in at court, you, you sign in appropriately. Um, in fact, with the Silex model, I've, I've had it where I have, um, uh, had it, when we do the Microsoft Teams now with remote trials, um, I was signing in as because uh, I didn't have the extended rights at the time. So I wanted to make clear that I wasn't trying to assert myself as a litigator and an advocate because I wasn't there yet. I was a fellow, but not a litigator and an advocate, which actually put me in a very unique position because I could theoretically with supervision rely on 
practice direction 27, paragraph one. Um, so I didn't have the full paragraph two, but I was not um, a litigator and advocate as I didn't actually have the extended rights at that time. So on that basis, I signed in with restricted rights to try to indicate that. Now, unfortunately, that did get confusing because the judge did think that I was restricting myself out of a right to actually appear there. So I did have to be more careful with that song. I changed it to basic rights um, so that I could avoid that concept. But the council one is another one that does creep up. Now, the bar has by custom and convention developed a monopoly on the use of that term. And I think Silex's best practice guidance is to avoid the use of that term uh, whilst regulated by Silex. And the reason for that is because if you look up the term in the Oxford English Dictionary, it does extend to more individuals than just the bar. But unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, for a valid reason, they did have a monopoly on higher rights of audience for uh, quite a significant period of time. Um, that has developed a public perception. And that public perception is counsel, oh, barrister. But it's very important that unless you have a valid practicing certificate from the Bar Standards Board, you don't come across as barrister because that is a different regulator, uh, a different practicing certificate. And that's not just coming across expressly, but coming across by perception. And it goes back to that full haired bodied individual getting off the Brighton and Hove city omnibus sitting at the back of the courtroom. If they heard the term counsel, would they relate that to the bar? And I think the going trend is that they would. Um, and on that note, I do stay clear of the term counsel. If it's utilized, I do try to correct it where there's the opportunity. There have been occasions where there haven't been the opportunity, but I do try to correct it. And I try to preempt it by signing in with a different sign-in. I have confirmed with the regulator as a workplace title, attorney is appropriate. Um, I have thought that maybe because I combine litigator and advocacy side, like they do in the States and refer to as attorney, that does work. But bearing in mind, I have a specialty for civil law. It technically is civil attorney, but I think I'm on fair grounds to be able to say just attorney for the purposes of a short order. And that's because um, who are the other attorneys? There's a patent attorney. Well, I hope they stay well clear of a courtroom. So I shouldn't be confused with them. And then there's also uh, a power of attorney, which actually arguably I do have a specific one. And then there's also a attorney general. And I, I, I think again, attorney general, the short form for that is AG. So I don't think I'd be misleading there simply to refer to myself as an attorney, but I distinguish myself from having a valid practicing certificate with the bar um, by utilizing it because they'll use counsel and then the SRA will use solicitor or solicitor advocate. So I think on that front, that's how I avoid being misleading um, and how I've thought best practice uh, to ensure that I comply with my overriding duty to the court. And I can see that you've really thought through it because um, as advocates, whenever we step foot uh, into chambers, um, albeit being in a, a court building, we really do have to pay attention that we're not misleading. Um, and, you know, as, as much as we may use the term advocate, I find that sometimes some judges are a bit more comfortable when you just say, okay, well, solicitor's agent for the purpose of today. Um, and it's, it's, it's just cleaner, it's neater, you're not misleading any member of the public. And you're absolutely correct. Counsel, generally public perception, automatically thinks of the bar so you want to stay clear of that term um, until you you have received that practicing certificate now yes. do you find that judges are receptive to this route of having rights of audience are they familiar with silex lawyers for example when when you are stating well you know sir um i'm a litigator an advocate or you're you're clarifying your status do you find that they are quite well aware of it and there are hardly any issues in terms of discussing that point. Um, so it, it depends as well. I hate to give that answer, but it is a, a gray area because again, it comes down to your audience and, and judges are very varied and diverse. And uh, some are really up with it. Others um, are more with the traditional um, mindset in terms of uh, not so much aware of the alternative pathways to a practicing certificate, or even if they are aware of the alternative practicing uh, of the alternative pathways, 
what those alternative pathways can actually do. So whilst they might well have a vague recollection that there are these in existence, uh, they might not seem to appreciate that they can uh, and, and do uh, have independent uh, pr practice and advocacy rights of their own. On the whole, I think most do tend to be aware, but um, sometimes I've had to give a little bit of a detailed explanation. And then of course, the more we go into um, the rights of audience, it becomes the more technical it becomes, and the more we lose focus from the actual substance of the the hearing itself, uh, and so it can be quite uh, distracting from the litigants' point of view, uh, and also uh, in terms of the, what the actual focus of the trial or the hearing is meant to be. Um, it is more of a subsidiary issue, and indeed it, it relates to a regulatory issue. So, in so far as there are um, regulators in place, then if there is a concern, the appropriate method would be to flag up that there is a concern, seek a brief explanation in relation to it, uh, and then if nobody's satisfied, uh, then of course there would be a duty to report. Uh, and then with that duty to report, there can then be a proper uh, form that will address uh, any of those concerns. Uh, if the person's not regulated, that might be a little bit more uh, troubling, but if they have a regulator, then there is a, a complaint um, uh, system that is set up to deal with that in any event. So really the, the hearings in substance and trials, uh, yes, there is a degree of needing to ensure competence to a, a certain degree and you want to make sure that, and there is a, a duty of the judge to make sure that the, 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 um, the parties, if they do have representation, um, I do have access to justice in the form of competent representation, but be that a limited role and not the primary focus of the hearing. And if there are concerns that go too far to the root of that, uh, then the uh, consideration should be made uh, as to whether there's a duty to report there so that an invest a proper investigation in that specific realm of professional conduct can then be explored further rather than taking the trial and the hearing too far away from the matter that is in dispute on that day. Now, how can people learn more about becoming a Silex lawyer? Yes, with that, there's many options. Speaking to Silex and practitioners is one. There's a directory on Silex's website that all um, fellows uh, and fellows of practice rights will be on as long as they continue to renew their practicing certificates. Um, there's also the ability to uh, do independent research online. Silex's website is quite good in that respect. Uh, there is, I'm just trying to find my notes as we get there. Um, Cause I, I know they have a, a wonderful website um, which really has everything. Uh, yeah, the, the website is quite detailed. And the other thing I was going to say as well is going to events, whether they're physical or remote, because I was going to say COVID permitting, but there are a host of uh, remote events. And with remote events, um, they can go on regardless of COVID. So do check into uh, different events. The ins of the court are always good for putting things up. They might not, I don't know if they've had Silex events. I think Silex would tend to have more of their own. They have things called branches. And these branches and different areas and different specialties can meet, although I think they were postponed due to COVID. So I'm not sure if there's any remote branch type of events going on at the moment, but do keep a lookout for those. Um, and then also speaking to Silex members and um, checking the directory, they will have on the directory the uh, professional address. Um, it is somewhat misleading. Um, I, I, and I, I tried to indicate that with the via, but the, the directory will indicate employer. Now, employer does need to be taken in a broader sense as in the employee, because it, it does not always refer to uh, an entity of which you're employed with, um, but it, it will refer to an entity of which you have a kind of agency relationship with. Uh, as a sole practitioner, I do work on the cab rank rule, and, and I do find that it is important that I don't 
uh, imperil my ability to do so by working on first come and first serve principles. So whilst there is an agency client uh, on the practitioner's directory, uh, that is the relationship. It is an agency client um, and of which I have a very good affiliation with, but that shouldn't be taken as in a strict sense uh, of employer. But uh, that's just one thing when you do go to the directory, um, you might see an employer's name there, but don't construe that as a um, narrow full-time or part-time employee because I'm not. Um, it will be um, a sole practitioner. Well, you know, before we even conclude today's session, I must ask you, would you ever consider cross-qualifying for the roles or the bar? Well, the, I would. And the, the answer, the reason for that at this point is because of higher rights. For me, I do want to develop as an advocate. Now, I've just secured the extended rights, so I want to build a profile in taking on uh, extended rights work now. And then once I've done that, then look at the ways to secure higher rights. If Silex by that time has made an application to the uh, Legal Services Board um, for approval with a competency scheme of a competency scheme to give out higher rights authorization, like the um, Solicitors Regulation Authority has done and the bar has always done, um, then I, I might consider at that stage staying with Silex uh, on, on that um, pathway. But at this current time, thinking ahead in terms of my development, um, uh, there will come a time if nothing does change with that in that respect, that I will need to cross qualify either through a mega exam or through a pupillage or an exemption to one of the two. Um, for uh, to seek a higher right scheme and certification. Um, and in, in that regard, there's a, a very interesting model right now that's being developed for waivers uh, and uh, exemptions to pupillage, if not the whole thing, then part of it uh, through the clerk's room pupillage academy. So there's different models like that that will certainly help to um, make any cross qualification hopefully a little bit easier um, if it is needed. But yes, in that respect, I, I am considering that. Um, but of course, I am going to look to develop my practice as an extended rights advocate or a civil attorney first, and then developing further from there, uh, at this stage, I would need to cross qualify. Now, I know, um, just thinking about it in terms of the benefit of cross qualifying, you would already be bringing a host of experience in terms of advocacy experience, if you were to cross qualify uh, in the future. To the bar and um it definitely would be a unique selling point it, it it would be something that would be memorable because i am positive that there are not many people that are undertaking this route and that will be able to bring this uh level of expertise in terms of being an actual advocate um to 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 the bar now do you think that there are any other benefits uh that you think you derive from cross cross qualifying uh, well, yeah, I was in terms of another benefit going the Silex route and then cross qualifying is if you're not just in, in inclined for the advocacy route and getting the higher rights, if you're inclined for the bench, then there's a big push right now to make a more diverse and broader judiciary. So looking at the numbers, the, um, the traditional approach of, uh, for appointing judges is the lot came from the bar. And now there's more solicitors putting their hat into the ring for that. And there's a big push to make that uh, more open. But equally, Silex is in the ring for that. And we do have a chartered legal executive Silex judges as well. There's a five year PQE requirement, but after five years, you're entitled to make the application and they do offer a judicial appointments thing. So cross qualifying, not only in the sense of uh, the bar for higher rights of the solicitors, uh, the regulation authority for higher rights, but also in terms of the bench, um, they do have a judicial appointments uh, course and uh, training, uh, and it is certainly uh, a very good benefit of joining Silex for that reason, because they are keen to push the, their numbers into the ranks of the judiciary. And at this stage, they are keen to push their ranks, but they're limited again to first instance judges. So I should think there's a keen movement to try to push that further. And in order to push that further, I mean, I might have this wrong, but my thinking on this is 
before you can have judges in the higher uh, senior courts, you would need to have advocates that are able to exercise rights of audience in those senior courts. Because if you can't regulate the advocates that appear before the courts, how can, that try to persuade the judge to make the decision, how can you have a judge that makes the decision before advocates, uh, when, uh, um, before you have advocates that are able to persuade, uh, be persuasive in making that decision before regulating the final arbiter of that decision. Uh, if that makes sense. I think I put that in a rather convoluted way, but um, the, um, the point is I should think that going the Silex route as they push more and more to be on par with the other two regulators is certainly going to create a USP for those coming from that route to, and this is a prediction, um, to want to open up spots in the judiciary, I, at least first instance, but ideally senior courts, um, because at the moment, in terms of the numbers, the bar and the roles are getting what looks to be a rather mo monopolized uh, uh, status quo, if you will, a rather monopolized picture uh, or piece of the pie, if I could put it that way, uh, in terms of who are judges in England and Wales to date? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and we do know that there is a, a push, a giant push for diversity uh, at the bench. And as you rightfully pointed out, it, it also has to do with uh, judges or persons coming with alternative backgrounds because that's what we need. That's what we need on the bench. Absolutely. Matthew, Matthew it was an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you today. And I know that this, this has been certainly beneficial to me, and I know it would be beneficial to, to all of our viewers uh, who are popping in, just probably to learn about this or who have never heard about it, but are really walking away from this episode um, equipped with the knowledge needed for the next steps. So thank you oh. so much for, for joining. And thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you so much. And everyone else, We'll see you on the next episode. Have a good one, guys. Bye.